um, climate risk has become a first order topic for policymakers. Uh, just as an example, on June 5th, the G7 finance ministers and central bank governors issued a statement, and this is just you know, a small part of their statement, but they, but they emphasized the need to green the global financial system so that financial decisions take climate considerations into account. Um, and then this, they believe, will help mobilize the trillions of dollars in the private sector that will be needed um, in order to reinforce government policy to meet the net zero commitments that governments have made. And I think what, what's particularly important about the, what they said, and I've added this emphasis is, we support moving towards mandatory climate related financial disclosures that provide consistent and decision useful information for market participants and that are based on the task force on climate related financial disclosures framework. So as they say at the last part of this paragraph I've taken out, investors need high quality, comparable and reliable information on climate risk. So I would like again to focus on the downside risk um, because this is particularly important for pension funds. Um, the downside risk is relevant for investors whose assets need to match their liabilities and face downside risk constraints. So, you know, as wealth protection becomes more important for the, for the pension participants, the pension funds would have a preference to avoid downside risk. And the fact that pension funds face large liabilities toward their beneficiaries and failure to meet those liabilities carries significant penalties. So, so the downside risk, and, and in particular, the downside risk that evolves from climate risk becomes very important. And, and it's also relevant for institutional investors more broadly. And, and again, this is gonna affect the pension funds because they're gonna be invested in the banks and insurance companies who are going to, to be facing perhaps higher regulatory capital requirements. Um, and often investments are based on the mean variance framework, which assumes that asset returns are jointly normally distributed. And that's an assumption that's likely violated because they're typically skewed. And again, we have this downside risk problem. So I would like to give you some evidence about how institutional investors um, think about the, the climate risk and how they incorporate it, in this case, how they incorporate it into their investment process. So this, these results here are from a global survey of large institutional investors that I conducted um, with, with two co-authors, Philip Kruger from the University of Geneva and uh, Zach Sautner from um, the Frankfurt School of, of Finance and Management. Um, and we had very large, important institutional investors that responded to this survey. And we asked them in this question, we asked them, how do you incorporate climate risk management into your investment process? And the two most common ways were through analyzing the carbon footprint of portfolio firms and through analyzing stranded asset risk. And they could, they could indicate more than one of these. Further, for those that analyze the carbon footprint of the, uh, portfolio firms, a large majority of them also reduce the carbon footprint of their portfolio firms. Um, and for those that analyze stranded asset risk, many of them also try to reduce their stranded asset risk. We also found that they used um, ESG integration and general portfolio diversification. They considered those were ways to um, incorporate climate risk management. What was somewhat surprising was that out of all the choices that were given, the one that was lowest used was divestment. We also asked about their approaches to engaging firms on climate risk. And the most common was holding discussions with management regarding the financial implications of climate risk. And this is, this is actually consistent with um, uh, earlier surveys that showed that holding discussions with management were the, were the, was the most common way that institutional investors approached governance in general. Um, they also, uh, a large percentage of them proposed specific actions to management on climate risk issues. So I just wanted to give some, an example of ESG engagement and downside risk, this and its effects. Um, 
in, a, in another study, we, we looked at the engagement by one large investor who had over $200 billion in assets under management. And this investor primarily uses a private and non-public way to engage portfolio firms. So, so it was 1,712 engagements across 573 targeted firms that we looked at. Um, across all the engagement, we did not find significant average reductions in downside risk for the firms, you know, between before and after the engagement. However, for those targets where, where um, the target management at the minimum acknowledged the existence of an ESG issue, ESG engagement significantly reduced downside risk. So in other words, for these engagements, there were some where the target management, target firm management ignored the engagement. Um, and so we didn't find uh, a, a reduction in downside risk. For the, uh, for the other firms where the target management at least acknowledged the existence and then in, in other cases actually uh, worked with the institutional investor to, to change, um, we did find that there was a significant reduction in downside risk. And this was particularly true with engagement over environmental topics, which was primarily over climate change, that had the highest benefits in terms of downside risk re reduction. Um, <clears throat> we also asked in our survey that I talked about earlier about investors' perceptions of stranded asset risk. And we asked them you know, whether the stranded asset risk in particular industries was high, low, non-existent, um, and what we found in terms of the percentage of respondents that believe stranded asset risk to be very high in, for coal producers was 25%. Um, and then we also found this to be the case for unconventional oil producers, um, conventional oil producers, and, and so forth. So these were the industries that had the highest levels of stranded asset risk, according to our respondents. We also asked the, the investors how, they, how important they considered climate risk disclosure. And 51% felt like it was equally important. Another 18% thought it was more important and 10% thought it was much more important as compared to reporting on financial information. And so there was a high degree of um, belief that climate risk disclosure was at least as important. It was 79% thought it was least as important as reporting on financial information. Okay, so I'm, I just have a couple of minutes left, I think. So I wanna talk about the pricing of climate risk and, and there's evidence from the option markets that, uh, that climate risk is being priced. The, um, <clears throat> There's increased regulation needed to meet the Paris Agreement. And, uh, and then there's political uncertainty about, about this regulation and how it affects asset prices. So the question that was asked in this research was, is the cost of option protection against the tail risk associated with climate policy larger for carbon intense firms? So the, using the option markets is, is particularly useful because they reflect market participants' expectations of risk and, and in particular, downside risk. So, so you know, it's, it's intuitive to think about how expensive is it for investors to use options to get insurance against downside uh, tail risk. So, so the authors looked at, uh, in particular, the 100 firms that account for 71% of the global industrial greenhouse gas emissions because carbon risks are very concentrated. And what they found is that um, the, the pricing of protection against downside to tail climate risk is in fact um, significant, uh, significantly different for the firms that have more carbon emissions. Um, higher carbon intensity increases the price of downside protection. So the slope D is the steepness of the implied volatility slope. And a higher value means that there's a deeper um, cost for, for the out of money options. 
In addition, they looked at uh, the, the Trump election because that was, that was the condition when there were changes in regulatory uncertainty. And so they, they looked to see whether, whether there was a change in the pricing of this tail risk protection. And when, they, when regulatory uncertainty is reduced, the price of downside protection decreases. Okay, so in conclusion, Pension funds should care about downside risk. The ESG lens of downside risk allows for a better understanding of the sources of the downside risk and how they can be addressed through risk management um, or engagement. And downside risk related to climate change should be a key focus for pension funds. Thank you.